So, let me tell you guys something honestly. Poker is one of the few professions that you can carry. One of the weirdest wardrobes to your day-to-day -day work. And I decided to wear sweats and a dirty t-shirt. Let's go. Alright, so we just pulled up to the casino here at the Commerce. That's what we're playing today, by the way. But quickly, I want to make a note here, and this is really important, so pay attention, guys. I'm feeling like in the season of giving, I miss Christmas is not here yet. It's not coming fast enough, so I have an idea. A good way, a win-win here, long story short, I'm going to be giving away $100 total to, I don't know, like three or four people, right? So $100 total, like 25 each person or whatever or two people for $50, or one person, I don't know yet. I'll, I'll let you know after the end of this session, probably, you know, give up. We wanna, we wanna distribute a little bit of the good vibes, right? So anyways, all you have to do is subscribe to the channel, and on Instagram, Facebook, whatever the hell you guys use, make sure you guys tag this video in that, in your post, and then, yeah, just make sure you let the C2B, uh, so close, the number two broke Instagram know you know, send them a screenshot of whatever you posted it, and I'll make sure to pick a, uh, a winner, a, a, you know, around there. You guys have been unreal. We have like almost 3,000 views in our most recent video, and that's, uh, it goes beyond what I could have imagined for the team here. So like I said, I want to just personally thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for making the effort, going above and beyond. When you guys don't have to, you guys can just shit on my videos and, and everything that the C2B family does, but you guys have done the opposite. You guys have been really supportive. You guys seem to like the, uh, the analysis, the hand breakdowns, and, uh, yeah, let's get back to California poker. Enough of the jibber jabber, right? You guys, you guys are here for the show. Let me give it to you. Alrighty folks, so let's wrap up today's session by going over all the hands. I know this is your favorite part of the whole vlog, right? Nobody wants to see my version of Casey Neistat in a poker vlog. Anyways, let's hop into the very first hand. I just sat down, first hand of the day, middle position raises to 50. I'm next to act with pocket queens, and I make it 175. The button to my direct left, four bets to 390. Initial raiser decides to fold, and the action is left on to me. And I'm thinking... I just sat down, we're playing 510, 1500 max. Am I gonna get stacked on the very first hand with pocket ladies? I think it over for a bit and I do realize there's a couple things going on. I think by folding pocket queens here, um, I'm just way too tight and that's not the kind of game I, I play. On the other hand, I have to put my opponent on a hand. Does he have jacks here enough and ace king here enough to compensate for the times that he, had ace, that he has aces and kings? And if the answer to the question is yes, the next answer to the question, if I decide to go all in, because that's pretty much the only move I can do at this point. He made it 400, that's a third of my stack. I don't think I can invest 33% of my stack pre-flop and then find a fold on the flop, I guess. Uh, maybe I can, but uh, again, I just, I think the best opportunity I have to win the hand, to play the hand, is to see all five cards, right? So with all that being said, I decide to call him. And he doesn't think for it very long and decides to make the call. And the run out is two, six, four, ten, two. We show our pocket queens and he mucks. The very next hand, a lot of action going on again. It's literally the next hand, my second hand at the table. Under the gun, the same guy from the last hand uh, that raised initially makes it 50 again. I look down at queen nine of hearts next to act. And I again decide to 3-bet here. Again, I like to set the, the table aggression quickly. I'm sitting on 300 big blinds. Queen 9, 8-handed is juicy. So I go ahead and do that. The button, who's an OMC, cold calls. The big blind cold calls. And the initial raiser folds again. The flop comes king of hearts, queen of clubs, nine of diamonds. So a complete rainbow board and we find ourselves with bottom two pair here. Oddly enough, the big blind decides to lead out for $200. Uh, in this situation, I think I'd be overplaying my hand if I decided to raise it here. Again, that's not terrible, but I think I'd be slightly overplaying it. And when I run into hands that are just better than mine, I mean, it's just a tragedy, really. 
And we're playing around 1500 effective with the other stacks, I should mention. Really weird, OMC from the button decides to make it 500. Big blind tank folds and is back onto me. And now I'm thinking, okay, what the hell is, what did I get myself into? And OMC can definitely have a hand like King Queen here in the big blind. Um, I think he can also have uh, Ace King, you know, OMCs do weird things with Ace King. So he can definitely have Ace King and overvalue it. Uh, he could have King, King Jack sometimes maybe. Uh, and then Jack 10, obviously. I don't think an OMC has very many combos of Jack-10. I think it'd have to be suited for him to cold call. And even then, I don't think it's strong enough for an OMC to call. So now I'm left with the range of, uh, you know, the, the absolute nutted hands. Like Kings, Queens, and Nines. Obviously, Queens and Nines I block because I double block, excuse me, because I have, you know, Queen-9, I have bottom two pairs. So that leaves just Kings. And can the OMC flat call Kings here? And then pretty much min-raise the flop. And, the, you know, I don't have all the answers to these questions. I don't play with OMCs enough. So I think with all that being said, for him overvaluing hands like maybe uh, Ace-King or King-Jack. And then sometimes, sure, you have King-Queen. I just think for the price, $300 more to call and the pot is already huge, it'd just be uh, absurd to fold. So I do make the call. The turn is an offsuit 10. So complete uh, game changer here. And I think about it for a little bit. OMC has $710 behind, and at this point I think this is the opportunity to turn my hand into a bluff. There is no way the OMC is raising the flop, I think, with a, a hand that contains a jack, besides King Jack. Um, but I think, again, I now get to get his hands like King Queen to fold, Aces, if he's doing some weird stuff with Aces, Ace King will fold, King Queen will fold, King Nine will fold, um, a chop Queen Nine will fold. Hands like King-10 will fold. There's so many hands that he has for value that have to fold now. Hell, even Kings, Queens, and uh, Kings, Queens, and Nines have to fold at this point. It's a four-liner to a straight. Any jacks make a straight. And um, with all that being said, I decide to turn my bottom two pair into a bluff. And I jam $710 effective into him. He goes into the tank for what seems like five and a half days. Um, and he ends up making the call. The river is a terrible, terrible card. It's a king. I show queen nine, which uh, is now counterfeited, and he shows pocket aces. So as I continue to punt off chips here at the Commerce, let's check in with Christian and see how the bike is going. He's gonna break down a couple of hands, and uh, let's see what he's doing playing 1-3 over there. Uh, this is like the last 15 minutes of our session. So, you know, we're pretty comfortable at this point. Like, we feel like we already booked a win. Um, we're kind of just, wrapping things up I'm my my uh, my chips are already in a rack at this point um, and under the gun I wake up with pocket jacks so I make it 25 and I really like my race size uh, for that game especially there were so many people just calling with just showing up with the like weirdest hands so I made it 25 with jacks under the gun uh, folds middle position and he's not looking at me right um, he's not looking and he kind of just throws in like two chips. And I think it's because there were straddles going and he thought he was just gonna like flat, but he didn't really notice the action. I mean, it's 7 a.m. so there are a lot of people that are tired. Um, and then he looks up and he sees that I had bet 25. And at that point he kind of like quickly like throws in three more chips, like kind of like not to be embarrassed, you know, like, so it just is, he doesn't feel very strong. You know what I mean? He's scrambling. But yeah, he's scrambling. He's trying to just like, <laughs> keep up appearances it feels like right so he throws in the extra three chips and uh then we go ahead it folds around we go heads up to a flop the flop is ace deuce five um rainbow and uh this is where i feel like i made a mistake i think i should be c betting there a lot um obviously my under the gun range is really strong um a lot of that includes you know high ace x hands um but i check to him with jacks he checks back um, the turn is a not, it's like a seven or an eight. Um, and I delayed C bet for $40 into like a pot of like 55, 60. Um, once again, I, I like my sizing. I think it's fine. I think I would do that with an ace a lot. Um, and he calls the river is a three. So there's a four liner. Oh, it's not a four liner. I'm sorry. There's the, the wheel draws out there. I checked him. 
thinking that it looks like I have an ace, right? Like, I check to him, and he cuts out a bet of 60. And I go in the tank, and I'm talking out loud. I'm trying to get a read on him. And I'm like, dude, I feel like you're bluffing me here so often. You're going for this bluff, right? Um, maybe because I checked the flop, he doesn't think I have an ace, and he thinks I'm willing to fold anything else. You know, any just middling pair. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to get a read on him. Uh, this is what I think convinced me to call. Because when I called, I was very confident with my jacks. Uh, I, I'm in the tank for like two minutes, and I just look at him, and he's so tight. And then I see his throat, his little, like, throat, his little, like, throat muscle, like, kind of bulge, you know? So I'm like, oh, man, this guy's tripping right now. This guy's, like, barely holding it together, <laughs> you know? So I'm, like, I feel like I'm milking it. Like, I'm just, like, trying to, like, you know, I'm trying to get all, put all these guys' tails, like, out on the table. I'm just taking my time. And I call, and he flips over pocket fours for the uh, wheel straight. And out loud, I'm like, yeah, that's that's about like the only that's about the only hand that makes sense here. Um, but yeah, we left. We finished the session up 120. We were down a lot, so we feel good about grinding it back. That seems to be the case. I always get really jittery at the beginning. I just try and force hands, you know, like a jackass, and I blow my first I blow my first buy, and then we gotta climb back. But you know, it feels good to climb back. Um, but yeah, that was our session. Uh, I know usually when I talk about hands, I come from the theoretical background, or maybe that's just what I think in my head, and in reality, I'm just coming from a complete asshole's background, but there's a couple of things in this hand that go against theory and more into the exploitative realm, and there's a, a couple of things that I want to discuss in this hand exactly, so I'm sorry there's a lot of hands to get to, but I'm going to try to be as precise as I can with the important hands that I think make up the session. In this hand, under the gun limps, I'm next to act with ace deuce and make it $55. Ace deuce of spades. We're seven handed at this point. The big blind calls and the limper calls. The flop is 10 6 3 rainbow with one spade. It checks to me, I see bet, a down bet actually, to $45. And the big blind thinks about it actually for a little bit of time, mulls it over, and makes a call. The turn is another six. So this card is almost always, in theory, the worst card for my range. Always. A, 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 you know, a middle card pairing is really bad for the initial raiser's opening range, right? And it's much better for the buttons range. After, I turn up the pressure here and actually bet $150. Again, in theory, this goes against everything you learn in GTO poker, you know, game theory optimal. This is not a good card to bluff on with ace high. But again, with the live tells I was getting on the table and the way he was reacting to the cards being dealt and, and you know, his mannerisms towards my bets, I felt very comfortable knowing that I'd be able to not, if not win it on, on the second street here, but a third bowl would, would have definitely got it done. And uh, to my um, my understanding, I think I knew exactly where I was at in this hand. He had a, like a middling pair or a drawing hand, like a 7-8. And uh, he does decide to fold. So just sometimes it's okay to throw some exploitative tendencies in with GTO. Have a little bit of both. There's nothing wrong with it. Under the gun limps. Hijack limps. I'm in the cutoff and I limp. The small blind and the big blind limp. I have pocket fives. Five of diamonds, five of hearts. The flop is seven deuce deuce club club spade. The big blind leads for $25. Under the gun calls and the hero calls. Turn is a five of spades, adding another flush draw and giving me a boat. And really, you know, this is a this is a favorable turn, some may say. The big blind checks. Under the gun bets 50, and now I'm here with the f uh, facing a decision, and that's obviously uh, just calling a raising. I think given that this is a limp pot, there's not a lot of money in pre-flop. It's time to build the pot. I decide to raise to $150. And after a little bit of thinking, the villain decides to make the call. On the river, the three diamond comes, and it puts the four liner to a straight again. And the two flush draws break. The villain leaves for $215, and after a little bit of pondering, and I guess Hollywood said may say, I decide to raise it to 800, uh, uh, to all in, excuse me, 800 effective more to the opposition. His effective stack. And after what is an infinite amount of time, tanking goes on, I don't know, two or three minutes feels like goes by. He decides to make the fold. Unfortunate there, uh, it happens. I think I love my bet sizing here. Uh, the reason I chose to go so big is because there's just no other sizing that I think makes sense 
what uh, in relation to the pot and and the and the, the the range of hands I'm representing here. I think I'm gonna have a lot of busted flush draws, um, a lot of busted combo draws, and then nutted hands like sevens and fives here. So really like it at, at the end of the day. And also I'm gonna do that with some four liner straights as well of my own uh, to get them off of a chop. So pretty nice hand all the way through and through. Unfortunately, that he doesn't find the call, but I'm really happy with my sizing nonetheless. Another hand to go over here. I open in the cutoff to $30 with Jack-10 of hearts. The button makes it $75. The big blind cold calls and the actions to me, obviously not gonna go anywhere, Jack-10 Jack of hearts. So I make the call. The flop is nine of hearts, seven of hearts, deuce of diamonds. The OMC, the OMC that I was talking about earlier, Donkley is for $75, we all call. The turn is the ace of diamonds. OMC checks this time and myself. I decide to take over the betting lead here because this should be a decent card for my range and not only that i think sometimes it's definitely good here to set my own price i'd hate to check it to the button and then just because he doesn't know what the hell to do with his ace uh, he makes it like 300 dollars a pot right i think i'd rather set my price to get to the river and allow myself to win the pot in a different way so i bet a hundred dollars and the villain in the button that was the initial raise excuse me the three better pre-flop makes a call and the omc tank folds the river is a complete brick you know we never like to see you know complete bricks but it is we were left here with jack on the river probably one of the nut, nut low hands we're going to be on, we're going to be at and i think about it for a little bit but just considering the mannerisms again this is where that exploitative and the, the tells and the white magic some may call it phil hemmuth i'm talking to you this is where that really comes in and a lot of people might be like, what the hell are you doing? You know, you have, you have all, you're blocking all the hands that you want him to have. It's, it's not about just thinking at that point. It's about thinking beyond that, giving him a range of hands, like what, what he can have. And again, with the mannerisms and the actions that he's having, it's the same guy I talked about earlier that I bluffed. Same thing here. I bet 215, giving myself a great price to make this, to make this bluff and very look, very, looking very value heavy here. Uh, some two pairs. I can still have a hand like nine seven in my range here with the, with the small sizing, and not too much thinking. He makes the fold. So again, it's really important to understand where you're at, where your opponent's at, and then what your hand looks like to your opponent. Uh, by leading the turn there, I give myself the opportunity to win it on the later street. I'm the aggressor. I'm showing aggression. I'm showing a keenness to this pot, to this, to, you know, to my hand, to the board, obviously. So. That's a big thing. I recommend you guys check that out. Um, look over the hand. Tell me how, what you think about it, really. But I, I'm, I'm happy with the way I played it. So in this position, under the gun is where I'm located. I have pocket fives. And I go ahead and raise it at 35. Under the gun, one hijack, cutoff, button, small blind, and big blind all call. We're going family style to the flop. The flop is five, six, ace with two clubs, the ace of clubs and the six of clubs. It checks to me. Again, there's a couple ways to go here, but I think it's about time we ramp up the aggression. I'm going to go ahead and bet a really big sizing here. I go ahead and bet $125. And I'm choosing to go with such a big sizing because this, this, the texture of this board is really wet. There's uh, definitely straight draws on this board, a ton of them. Um, I don't need to go to over every single one of them, but you can, you know, obviously make that out. Not only that, I don't have an ace, obviously. So, you know, the, the hope is that somebody else does, in this situation at least. So, I decide to bet $125, like I mentioned, and only the button calls. The turn is the eight of clubs, so it does put that flush draw out there. But this is not a scare card, and let me tell you why. This isn't a scare card, to me at least, because the way the hand played out. The opposition that I'm playing against, I think would be raising a flush draw with his SPR. Uh, by betting 125 on the flop, it's leaving himself around 600 behind going to the turn. Not that I'm saying he's gonna jam all in, but I think he'd play a little more aggressive, one. Two, uh, by the ace of clubs being out there, the only nutted hands that he can have here are gonna be like king queen and king jack of clubs, king 10 of clubs maybe, but I don't think like king nine of clubs, king eight of clubs, queen, queen nine, of, queen eight of clubs are gonna be getting there. So I'm not too worried about the flush draw. I'm more putting him on an ace here or still a draw like at eight, seven, obviously. So with all that being said, I decided to bet $275 and he thinks about it for quite some time and folds. So obviously he didn't have the flush, but that's don't lose value when you have a hand for value. Under the gun limps, OMC limps. Here on the small blind with pocket fours, limps as well. The big blind, makes it 45 everyone calls the flop is 774 with two diamonds i go ahead and check and we're checking again to our friend from the last hand who is in the cutoff right now and bets 75 dollars 
it folds to me. And I think in this situation, this is a, some people might be scared, but I think by betting here, he actually has to have a lot of hands for value. And the hands that he doesn't have to have for value would be, you know, so inclined to race. And uh, with that being said, because I flopped a boat, I'm not scared of a flush coming. And I know that if I let him get to a river without putting all of his chips in or close to it, um, I'm going to lose a lot of value if it breaks out for him. With all that being said, I go ahead and make it $275. It folds back to him and he decides to make the call. The turn is the king of hearts. It's a great card for, for us again. I go ahead and bet $400. Uh, not too much thinking for him and he decides to make the call again. On the river, we get a pretty great card. It's just a pure blank. It's an offsuit 10. Um, the only hands we're scared of now I think are 10-7 suited. Not too many combos of that left. And I think he'll have a lot of hands like A7, 8-7, 9-7, 6-7. Seven. A lot of hands here for value uh, that he's going to have to call off. I decide to jam for his effective, sca his effective stack of $400 Hello. remaining. And after quite some tanking, he again makes the right fold. So props to this guy. I think there's three times in the session I had a set against him on the river and he made the right fold every single time. So honestly, man, I nobody was folding for me except for that guy today. So, props to you, man, I guess. Alrighty, folks, we're winding down here. We have to run through these hands, like I said, because I'm trying to get all of this compact. It's, it's, I still have to go to sleep. This is just after the session, but I had to get it on camera because I'm really excited to talk about these things. The hero raises under the gun with ace of hearts, three of clubs to $35. We're playing four-handed at this point. The hijack, or we're playing five-handed at this point. The hijack, which is next to, next to act calls, the small blind calls, and the big blind calls. The flop is 249 club club. It checks to me. I decide to bet $150. Next to act, which is the hijack, makes it $165. It gets back to me, and uh, the hijack is sitting with about $1,000 effective, and it puts me in a situation. I don't think I want to call with the hand as weak as this, but I definitely think I can put the pressure on his hand. I'm the initial raiser. This board in, you know, the cards on the board not be might not be favored for my hand, but my, you know, if I have a, a, a over pair, I think I'd like to play it aggressive, especially five-handed against a raise here. So after quite some thinking, I actually decide to make it $450. And again, I think I'm just using the uh, the initial raise and, and what my range, my perceived range should be here. And again, fold equity. That's a big thing, fold equity. I'm using the fold equity in my hand. Uh, all, all I have at this moment is a gut shot, uh, but what I also have is fold equity. That's a good word. We should learn that word together because uh, i got to practice that more often. Anyways, it gets back to him and he tanks again for quite some time. And at this point, I'm just thinking like, all right, this guy's going to call. i got to bank it on the turn. Just give it to me. Bank it. But to my happiness, he does decide to lay it down. So, whoo. That was a big bluff that we got through there. That was awesome. I'm really happy the way we played that. It's okay to be aggressive. It's really exciting, actually. Especially in these higher stakes games, it's important to be aggressive. For the very last hand of the night, we're going to go over this uh, beautiful hand that just occurred. We're playing three hand at this point. It gets to me in the small blind. I have ace, jack of diamonds. I raised to 25. I pretty much, like, not purposely, but, like, because I was so aimlessly, like, playing at this point. I misclicked. I should have made it like 35-40 from the small blind, but whatever. The big blind's like fumbling with his thoughts almost and decides to just make the call. The flop is 9-4 deuce, diamond, diamond. So we flopped the nut flush draw in two overs. I go and see bet this board. I'm loving it for $50, which is the pot. And I get raised by the villain to $150. So now I'm like, what the heck is going on? Did he just flop top? Like, what is he doing? Like... This guy's raised me on four different flops today, this exact same guy, every time I've seabed him. So, I think his range is like pretty uncapped. There's no way that he has had it every time. Um, but not only that, maybe he's just overvaluing a hand, or maybe he has a, a you know some kind of combo draw himself. If he has a hand like 3-5 of diamonds, uh, if he has a hand like, well, like, um, you know, like a gut shot, it's a good raise on his part. So, again, enough flush draw. There's no way I'm ever going to fold here. I decided to make the call. The turn is not much help. It's the five of clubs. Um, so now we pick up a, actually it is decent help. We now pick up a gut shot to go along with the nut flush drawn or two overs. I check to him and the villain bets 325. I'm sitting with about 1400, 1500 effective at this point. 
I don't think there's anything again to do here besides just call. I like sometimes if I think, again, there's a good opportunity to use fold equity here, but I think considering that now he obviously has some kind of hand for value, uh, I cannot do anything besides just call here. Uh, I think the fold equity would be a little too, it'd be a little too, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'd be a little too hopeful to think that a shove here would get through often. The river is an ace of hearts, completely a curveball. I was not expecting that to happen, right? I mean, it's good that I do. I have some showdown now. So I decided to check it to him and he bets $500. So at this point, I'm thinking, you know, what hands can he get with on the river that now beat me? I think three-handed, every pocket pair has to three bet here, right? So nines, fours, and deuces. I'd say at least nines and fours have to three bet. Hands like ace nine, um, nine ten, jack nine, queen nine are all going to be doing weird things like this too sometimes, I think. And then for the off chance that he had an over pair, like, I don't know, tens, nines, queens, and he didn't three bet pre-flop for some reason, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, again, I just don't have a lot of experience playing with these players. So it's hard for me to, like, oversell anything and, you know, kind of sell you guys this pipe dream that, like, you know, I have a crazy read on this guy and I just think this is going to happen. I just think that folding top pair in this situation is too strong. And this is the hand that I know is going to get everyone to comment about, oh, my God, what are you doing? This is a fold. What are you doing? He's going to have quad nines. Oh, my God. No, it's okay. Take a deep breath. Look over the hand gate, the way it was played, the sizing he chose. His river sizing is way too small for the hands of value that he's he, that he should have. And what my perceived hand to him looks like is a flush draw. It's pretty face up. So he could be betting a wide variety of hands here. With all that being said, and because I'm a station at the end of the day, I do make the call. He flips over pocket queens. So obviously we get lucky there. One of our 12 outs hit on the river. So it was pretty much a coin flip on the flop, 48%. Uh, on the turn, 24%, somewhere around there. And on the river to hit that ace was a majestic thing, I will say. So, I mean, that was a huge hand. I can't be happy enough to describe how, you know, <laughs> I'm happy that it happened, obviously. I mean, I'd be uh, a fool to tell you guys that I wasn't. Uh, but I'm not going to, I'll sell myself short on a lot of things. But that is a call, I promise you. Uh, not every time, of course. But I think in this instance, with his bet sizing and a little bit of play that I've had with him today, I'm happy with my call. To wrap up today's video, um, we were in today's uh, commerce session for $2,200 and leave the game with $2,700 in our pocket, giving us a $500 or 50 big blind win of the day. Um, all things considered, there was a couple of hands that were just kind of punty and... Uh, not really very educational and very basic hands like getting all in three-handed for like 40 big blinds and that happened like two or three times I had to call off a short stack and I lost and some flips so pretty like ABC hands that you know don't need any breakdown in but nonetheless I want to thank you all dearly for the continued support on our channel Christian BJ and myself I can speak for all of us in saying that the amount of support we've received is um, it, it's almost overwhelming sometimes. It, it, it's weird to think that somebody cares enough about us and cares enough about the brand and, and cares enough about poker, really. You're a little worried, you know, like, is poker going to die? At least in America, we don't have a strong online poker presence. Uh, but I guess we do, after all, with all the weird poker clubs uh, that are <laughs> taken to the streets here. Um, but nonetheless, it's unreal to support. We're very thankful for everything you guys do for our channel. And I do want to recommend you guys do the giveaway. It's free. It costs you nothing. And you get a free $100 for doing it. Or at least an opportunity to win the $100. I'll see you guys in the next episode. We'll see where the hell this vlog takes us. There's a small chance that you'll see us on a live stream that is pretty popular. But until then, uh, just bidding you a farewell for myself and the rest of the crew. Hopefully in the next episode, um, we do a little better. Until then, peace.